Gang, are you looking for better sleep and relaxation or relief from pain or anxiety without feeling totally drugged? Well, let me tell you about True Hemp Science Full Spectrum CBD products. True Hemp Science promises premium quality, pure ingredients, and true value. They source the highest grade organic hemp from around the world to handcraft the finest full spectrum CBD products in the Austin area and beyond. They offer a complete line of full spectrum CBD products, including oils, tinctures, skincare lotions, sports rubs, gummies, and chocolates. Gang, I have been using their products for the last few months and they've lowered my anxiety and they've given me incredibly restful sleep. The kind of sleep that when you wake up, you feel rested and ready to take on the day as opposed to waking up feeling anxious or waking up feeling groggy. Well, gang, I have good news, too. How Did I Get Here has teamed up with True Hemp Science to bring you a special offer that benefits all of us. Spend $65 or more at TrueHempScience.com and receive 296 milligrams of their number 81 distillate, which is great for sleep or relaxation for free. That's right, gang, for free. Just go to TrueHempScience.com backslash H-D-I-G-H. That's TrueHempScience.com H-D-I-G-H. Balance your body and mind with True Hemp Science Full Spectrum CBD products. Let's get down. You may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? It's time for How Did I Get Here? And now here is your host. I'm Johnny. I'm your host. Welcome to the show. I hope you guys have all had a good week. Whatever it is you did this week, I had a, I, my week got a lot better, gang. I uh, I've <laughs> did a photo shoot with Skyrocket on Wednesday. It was it was fun, uh, hanging out with the gang and 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 just laughing because I forget that when you're in a band together, even even us that have been together for over 20 years at this point, we still always are laughing when we're in a room together. Someone's saying something and everyone's laughing. Someone's riffing and everyone's laughing. That's the magic of being in a band. That's that's what you signed up for. Not just the music, but the hang. You know what I mean? That's the magic. So Wednesday was great. It was kind of healing to be with my my brothers and sisters. I want to thank everyone once again who reached out uh, when I told you my traumatic story of running into my ex girlfriend on Sunday on uh, Tuesday show. So thank you so much for reaching out. Uh, I'm sorry that that's happened to all of you too. It's a shitty thing to happen. It makes you feel sick. It makes you feel weird. And uh, it makes you do dumb stuff. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you so much for hanging by me. Uh, gang, I want to let you know that uh, next weekend, Skyrocket will be playing two big public shows. Uh, Friday, August 26th at Last Concert Cafe in Houston, Texas. Get out there. Find them at lastconcertcafe.com. Uh, always a great show there. It's a giant place. It's outside. Last time, I believe it was sold out. And that, that was huge. So come on out, Houston. Let's do it. Let's sweat it out. It's fun playing in the heat. You know what? Some people complain about it, and sometimes I complain about it when we have to do it a lot. But honestly, the real deal is, is playing those hot and sweaty shows is how I came up playing music here in Texas. You know, doing those long shows, man. Sweating, just sweating, just leaving the place drenched. Now, it's, sometimes it's a little rough trying to get through it, but afterwards, you really did something. And everyone's out there sweating it out. I love it. Anyway, then Saturday, uh, August 27th, we will be back at uh, 310 Austin City Limits Live here in Austin, Texas. Doing a, We only play here in town a few times a year. So uh, if there's tickets left, get them. Do it. Come on out. It's a super fun show. Oh, one more thing about Last Concert Cafe. That is an early show. We start at 8. Uh, since all, of the, all, the, all the new condos have gone up downtown in Houston, here in Austin, too, Uh, There are sound curfews and sound ordinances and all this stuff. So the show in Houston starts at 8. And uh, and I believe that the the one in Austin at 310 Austin City Limits Live starts at 9. So anyway, get out there. Go to skyrockettheband.com and get involved. Go look it up for yourself and find out. That's all I'm trying to do is tell you that. All right? Gang, I have a great show for you today. Legendary recording engineer and producer Lenise Bent is my guest on the show today. You're asking yourself right now, who is Lenise Bent? Maybe some of you are. Uh, she worked on albums like Breakfast in America by Supertramp, Asia by Steely Dan, 
The Last Waltz by the band. Oh, just those albums. <laughs> Insane, right? Also, uh, she became the first woman to record a certified platinum album when she engineered the album Auto American by Blondie, which featured the songs The Tide is High and the legendary song Rapture. Now, why is Rapture a legendary song? Because that kind of introduced rap to kids like me at that time. Kids that didn't really know what rap was, that were living in the Woodlands, Texas, and all of a sudden they heard these, these names like Fab Five Freddy. Right? Who's that guy? Legendary rapper. So uh, not only is it a legendary album because uh, because of Rapture, but also it's legendary because Lanise Bent became the first woman to record a certified platinum album when doing that record. Uh, Lanise has gone on to do so many different things in this business. She's a foreign dubbing supervisor working on record on um, movies for Disney like uh, Road to El Dorado, Shrek and Shrek 2. She talks about it. She was there when they recorded it in, into different languages like Israeli or she yeah, traveled all over the world doing all this stuff. Amazing. Amazing story she has. She also beat cancer, which is an amazing story as well. She got it early on and she and she went through all the treatment, stepped out of the music biz for a while, kind of looked at the music biz as being a little bit a little bit toxic at that time for her and her, you know, the lifestyle of it all for her and her life. So she stepped out for a little while, but came back strong, making records with uh, with great bands like Primal Kings and also Jan of a Magnus, who was on the show a few weeks ago. She's actually the one that set this up. So this is a big thank you to Geneva. I asked Geneva when we were talking because I'd heard about Lanise Bent on a previous post- podcast. I learned about her from my friend Angel M, who, uh, who was doing a Sound Girls thing. This was back in the spring. Anyway, it's so great to have Lanise on. I want to thank Jan- Geneva for, for, for introducing us and, and talking to us uh, or getting us, getting us together and being able to do this podcast. I was very, very excited to talk to this legendary, legendary Recording engineer and producer, Lanise Bent. So without further ado, this is me and Lanise talking it. Talking, talking, talking. Let's get down. How are you feeling? I'm feeling a lot better. I tested negative earlier. So... Finally, yeah, finally, but yeah. but that I've had it twice, yeah. and uh, it's no joke. Yeah, I also no joke. I also had it twice. It's no it's no joke. Thanks for thanks for yeah. rescheduling and stuff. Um, How are your lungs? Your lungs great. okay? Yeah, I oh, I good. started vaping again today. I walked five miles this morning with my dog. I'm stoked. Started vaping again. Oh my god! <laughs> just just well, crystallize those little honey. I, I know, I know. But last year, I quit when I got I got I got coronavirus last summer, and I quit smoking cigarettes. So, mm-hmm. uh, well, that was good for last. One year. last thing. I, yeah, I know. I could, I'm I'm a digger on this because I'm I'm not a fan of anything that damages anybody's lungs. Of course. So, and you're also a, a yeah. survivor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. I, don't, I don't want to just start off there, but we, we might as well, because there's a musical question that I have about this. Okay. Oh, okay. So uh, you, you developed stomach cancer while you were working on a Blondie record with Mike Chapman. Well, Is that right? Or it no? takes a lot longer for cancer right, to right. come well, around found out um, you had than it that. that time. Yeah, I think it was, um, yeah, that's when I found out I had it. It wasn't um, because of her uh, no. <laughs> or because of Debbie or because of them. It, it could have been because of Mike Chapman. Yeah. But um, <laughs> the, the overall thing was um, it was uh, very stressful and, and uh, you know, what was going on at the time was... Uh, um, complicated as far as what I was involved in with this uh, production company and uh, anyway so that could have been it but um, you know things were pretty uh, wild and woolly for a few years there so uh, you know my body pretty much I think said uh, you know if you're not smart enough to take care of yourself yeah. I'm going to step in and just shut you down <laughs> I, yeah. So you will learn. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I have friends that are that are engineers, and and uh, not not so. Uh, I don't worry as much now as I, I I did at one point. You know, I 
uh, that job can be pretty sedentary. And if you're busy, you know, Mm -hmm. and you're a person that throws in the hours, you can be sitting down for 10 hours a day or 12. 10 hours a day? 14 hours a day. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Nothing. Okay, so this this, stuff. this question I have, and I've I've talked to a few other uh, fantastic engineers and producers about this who lived through this time. So, what you you ended up taking some time off? Hmm. Yeah. And what, about eight years. What were those years? Wow. You know. I haven't ever really talked about this to anyone. Is that bad? Because um, I became a girlfriend. Or I put being a girlfriend first, then career just, you know, on the back burner. Or did, I took it off the stove. Yeah. And uh, um, so, um, and that was a, a really amazing time. I'm very, very grateful to my ex. Um for allowing, for providing me with a wonderful opportunity to get well and to um, um, do something completely different that was a lot of fun. I lived in the Caribbean for a while. I wow. lived in London a bit. We had a place in London. We had a place in Scotland. He was Scottish. Wow. And, uh, but most of the time we lived on a boat here in Los Angeles. But then we had a house down in the... British Virgin Islands and, um, uh, which I, that was my therapy to get well was to go down and, and oversee the building of this, taking a little West Indian house and turning it into a a bigger West Indian house. It still had its West Indian charm. But, um, anyway, so I'm very grateful to him for that. And, um, then I did get well. And we did split up and I came back and went into post-production audio. The thought of going back into the music business at that time, um, you know, I knew that that, the stress of that is what, you know, put me where I was. And so I wasn't about to um, subject myself to that so soon, you know. Uh, So I went into post and... um, Started doing foreign music and effects tracks for the um, Walt Disney cartoon catalog. I saw that. That's that's a pretty amazing it gig. It must have, I mean, obviously, like, it's not as a, uh, when you, it's not as, as hedonistic as when you left the, the music <laughs> business, like, no, that 70s never and was. 80s post yeah. yeah. Yeah, just. Post isn't like that, but it pays well. Yeah. And it's people just getting a job done, and I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We made, I did a lot of foley. Do you know what foley is? No, I was going to ask you. Uh, I I have that written down that uh, that you're oh, okay. foley mixer editor. Yeah, well, foley is the uh, organic um, sound effects, and you know, it's not the car crashes, it's not the explosions. Um, and all the weird sounding stuff, it's the hand pats, it's the, right. uh, you know, setting this down, touching my headphones, you know, picking up the phone, setting the phone down, footsteps, um, cloth. Right. When people walk, you add all, all these are the organic sounds that uh, everybody thinks gets picked up in production, but it doesn't because... Production is just supposed to get the dialogue. Right. And if it gets anything else, that's great. But if it doesn't, um, you have to add it. Right. And um, otherwise, people are walking around and it's like they're floating. There's no footsteps. And so all that stuff's added, believe you or no. And um, you don't know that. And you never. Um, the only time you hear about your work, if you're a fully um, mixer and editor, is if um, you did it wrong, <laughs> and they could tell it was fully. Because if you do it right, nobody can tell it's fully. Nobody says anything, so it's a really thankless job. So if your ego needs to, a pat on the head, right? Um, you know, you're, you're you're gonna feel you know 
neglected and dejected as a Foley person because the last thing you want somebody to say is, wow, I really like those footsteps. Yeah. Because that means, wait a second, you could tell they weren't real. So, yeah. yeah. Let, let me so ask that, you this. There was that. Uh, on mm-hmm. those things, uh, just a technical question. W- were you, mm-hmm. I'm sure you were getting uh, sounds from a library, but also you were probably doing a lot of recording organic sounds yourself as well? Oh, gosh. That's what Foley is. No, that's is, what it is. You it actually is, make the sounds. There's no library. Sometimes sometimes I made the sound. You have a Foley artist or two out there, and they have a whole bunch of props <laughs> and a whole bunch of set of shoes there's fully stages with all these different surfaces wow. and all of um and you know flushing toilets and showers and and you know uh, water features for you know paddling around if you know those water things you have to do to picture yeah and um so uh mostly i directed that and recorded that and then made sure it was in perfect sync it has to be frame accurate but sometimes I got to be the Foley artist, too, when I worked with uh, um, another colleague of mine. We'd take turns. Okay. He'd engineer some of the time, and I'd engineer some of the time. And he'd do the props. He'd be out in the studio. And it's the closest thing to recording music because you have an artist out there. Right. And you're working with a real human being. Right. Because I'm a people person. Yeah. So it's sitting in a dark room, pulling stuff from a library, you know, previewing, you know, this, this boot step isn't as good as that boot step is, you know, just shoot me. Yeah. You know, I'm that sitting in a dark room, making noises by myself. Uh, right. I don't have that personality, but there are a lot of people who are perfect for it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, the thing Uh-oh. that I was going to get to on that and that, uh, mm-hmm. is that during that time that you were off, like uh, if you were doing um, Auto American and then and then took that eight years off after that, the sound of music changed so much with the advent of digital effects and the sound of drums like triggered and like, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah, well, like, MIDI became really a big deal right. during that time. And a lot of digital um, equipment, I'm uh, actually, I had at my disposal um, two EMT 250s. Do you know what those are? Those are the first digital reverb units. They look like R2D2. They're like $250,000 a piece at the time. That's before, and like, the lexicon. We had an unlimited budget. Hmm? That was before, like, the lexicon and, and that stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lexicon came after that. Well, yeah, um, so... They're, they're, I'm looking for a, a tissue. There, there was such, it is so hot. I'm, such, I'm sorry. such an intense, like, sonic shift that... The, I'm, I'm 53, yes. and, you know, you can look back as a kid, like, like me, music sounded a certain way in the 70s. Like all of a yeah. sudden there were mics were were on individual drums. And even though you didn't realize that when you were listening to rumors, you could tell there was something different than meet the Beatles and the sound of the drums. Right. Mm-hmm. Or at least mm-hmm. in, in my recollection. But then all of a sudden these drums had these bombastic like shotgun sounds and all of music kind of took on this like huge like gated reverb like trip. And what I was going to ask you was uh, w- was working on these records that are viewed as like sonic masterpieces everything from like asia to 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 breakfast in america to like to tusk what was what was your feeling on the sound of music like were you were you into the fact that things were changing and it was a groove or were you like oh god this is really stiff sounding now and like machiney well um for me it was more about the style of recording to me um, I enjoy the act of recording um, a band, live people playing real instruments, and the challenge of destructive audio, and the smell of tape, and the feeling of you know putting a reel of tape on a machine and running the transport and. Um, 
work in faders and yeah, yeah, all yeah, that yeah, sort yeah. of stuff yeah. and um and editing and you know yeah. punching in and punching yeah, out I love and, punching. Yeah, yeah. and and capturing inspiring and capturing performances yes. where you know you have to make decisions boom and so the vibe is is um is captured as well right and so um for me the style of recording that people are doing now yes um where you know you're basically on a keyboard and you're looking at a screen and you have a playlist yeah. and you're going to comp it all yeah. next week and yeah, here's yeah, 70 yeah, takes yeah, yeah, of yeah. a vocal and stuff that's not my happy place that you know that's that's just um that's like doing sound effects right. um for right. a film i don't it doesn't bring um you know, right. tears and, and goosebumps. At, at, that, and, at that point, you're not capturing magic. You're trying to carve out perfection, which doesn't raise the hair on your arms. No, not at all. Right? It's, perfection it's, it's is just, just perfection. Sound design. <laughs> yeah, sound yeah. design. But, um, so, that's, you know, a choice that I make. In fact, you know, of course, we all record digitally as well. I, I'm fortunate to be called upon to record you know, analog projects because I can, uh, a lot of people would like to, they don't know how. And, um, but I do. And I'm so grateful for that because, uh, it's exciting and it's like, um, like art, yeah. you know, and I become a member of the band and, and I become their biggest fan or the member of the artist or whatever it is. But, um, uh, digitally I still record that way. Yeah, yes, yeah, so do you I. Know, with so that intention, because I want it fast. I like to work really fast. Yeah. And I like the capture, and I like it to be exciting yeah. for all of us, you know? And uh, yeah. so, you, you know, the, the, if I can keep that up there, then, you know, I'm yeah. happy. Yeah. The, thing, the only thing I don't miss about tape yeah. is, is being like a vocalist and having to deal with rewinding. It is nice to be able to immediately jump back into the thing without having to wait no, of those, course. those 30 or 45 seconds that can take you out of the moment, you know? Oh, of course, yeah. of course. Um, but the, the rolling back part for the engineer and the producer, you listened right. to it going backwards. And you could, you yeah. learned how to decipher how something was recorded or in the right place or if um, if you got it right, just in that play, rolling it back. Wow! So listening to that to, to tape rolling back, yeah, that was an acquired skill. That was p- part of determining if you got it, if you captured it right or not. Yeah, you know, you listen to that. Wow. But as a performer, oh yeah, you know, totally get that. And you have to, you know, that that's why you get really good as a running the tape. Like yeah. if I'm doing vocals. My tape, my assistant isn't doing that. I'm doing that okay. because I can go really fast right. if it's to tape or to, um, you know, digitally to Pro Tools, whatever. Yeah. And um, because I'm with you on that, boy, you, you want to keep that yeah. momentum up. Um, Especially as so. a singer, I noticed it more than as, a, as, a, as an instrumentalist instrumentalist Mm -hmm. um you know i was gonna say that 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 uh what you're talking about and sort of your uh ethos and recording and like capturing a vibe and stuff Mm -hmm. like that i was listening to this primal kings album um that you did and 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 that really it does it has there is that feeling on it you feel people communicating yeah thank you for saying that you know i i know how it makes me feel but you know i don't know how it makes anybody else feel I wish I, you know what? I should get you a, the vinyl of that. Oh, I would love that. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I I'll send you vinyl. one. Yeah. Because that's the, that was the whole point. That's why they brought me in there was because they wanted a um, AAA legacy quality, um, no D word, no off. You know, it's, yeah. uh, you know, because in digital, it's, you know, you, for every on, which is the one, you have a zero, which is an off. So regardless of how much your sample, how high your sample rate is and your filters and all of that, it's uh, 50% of that information is still missing. 
Yeah. And um, that may have a lot to do with the emotional response because we don't just listen with our ears. We listen with our entire body. Yeah. So just the, our ears are only the main thing we listen to listen with, but they're limited. Yeah. We can't hear above certain frequencies or below certain frequencies where well, our body does yeah. in response to that. And we have, you know, those secondary and tertiary harmonics and all of that stuff that give us an emotional response um, in those ultra high frequencies and things um, that are floating around, you know, we're, we receive all that. And so if we're not getting that, then we're not going to have quite the experience that, you know, the artist would want us to have. That's right. That's how I feel about it. Yeah. Um, all right. So and, and your, your career has been documented a bunch of times. And that's one of the things that like last night when you said, uh, what should I prepare? I was going through and watching a bunch of stuff, which maybe I shouldn't have done, or maybe I should have done. I don't know. The produce like a pro one. That was really, I like that guy. He seems like a nice guy. Oh, 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 produce. Oh, oh, Warren. Yeah, Warren Hewitt. Warren. Oh, yeah. I adore him. Yeah. He's so neat. He's so enthusiastic. Yeah. That was a funny one because, as you can see, when you heard that, it was almost like um, he had no idea. He didn't know anything about me, it seemed like. And I've known, I've run into him for years and all of that. But I, he was so shocked to find out that I'd worked on his, some of his favorite records. And I thought, well, wh why am I here then? <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you want to talk to me? Oh, no. <laughs> so that was, that was funny. Um, I was, you probably picked that up. I was going, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one thing is, is that I was going to say is that you, you, you went to recording school and you were, you were the only woman of 50 guys. And uh, that was the first day. Yeah, that was the first day. And then, uh, mm -hmm. you had a boyfriend who mm -hmm. was a singer and his guitar player, um, worked yeah. with Leon Russell and that guy was Roger yes. Lynn. Yes. I've I've heard that story uh, in interviews with Mike Campbell from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, who was like, uh, yeah, I remember there was this guy in the back named Roger, and he was building a drum machine. And we were like, why would you do that? <laughs> like, And then sure enough, even yeah. they were using yeah, he, he was, yeah, well, because, um, well, um, because they were on shelter, I guess. Yeah. Or on, on yeah, yeah. They were recording on um, Leon Studio label. Yeah. Yeah. In in Encino, and uh, but uh, my boyfriend Robert Fleischman, uh, uh, they had this band, and I was in film school, and, uh, and but an enormous, enormous fan of Leon Russell. So <laughs> when Roger. For some reason, I'm talking to him on the phone. I don't even know why. And uh, he says, oh, yeah, I got this great gig engineering for Leon Russell. You should come over and see his studio. And I was like, <gasps> and I hadn't really been in a recording studio before. I had uh, I'd only been in one once and it didn't connect with me at that time but boy when i went over to leon's as you've heard in other interviews yeah. that's when i had my epiphany and the angels sang and that was the rest of my life well you know what's funny is you you talk about uh his wife or it was going to be his it wasn't his wife yet mary uh mary mccrary right i'm pretty sure that was her last name whose voice yeah. you heard now i remember being a kid and one of the albums uh a big album in my house that my mom was into was that they had a an album called the wedding album do you remember that yes that was that wasn't the one i was okay. hearing but okay. i remembered that one before that what they were working on was called will of the wisp right and um, i don't know if i know that song Oh boy, there's some great songs on there. I think Masquerade is on there. Oh, it is. And, uh, Maybe I do know it. And um, but um, there are just some amazing songs on there. Back to the Island, twenty one tracks oh, yeah. of background vocals. Oh, then we had that album as well. We had to. I remember that Back to the Island song from my childhood. Yeah. Yeah. And watch the sun go down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and see so you're the sea roll. 
So, I so know, love that song. You went on to go and work at Village Recorders, which is a world famous I did. Hollywood studio. And so when you went there, you were an assistant. Were you kind of like assigned to uh, to sessions or to engineers or to a room or? They you worked for the studio and there were six assistants. Um, remarkably, there were four females. Uh, eventually, there was only one, and then um, I was hired along with Barbara Isaac, who went into dialogue of post-production history. Um, anyway, we were hired on the same day, so that suddenly it went from one woman to three, and then a couple months later, Carla Frederick was hired. So for the most part, while I was there for the three years, um, there were uh, four women and two guys. And um, what they would do is, depending on the session, the, the studio manager would determine um, who would be most appropriate for different types of music. And okay. I was, uh, yeah, so. So that's how I you ended up more in the progressive room. To, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. That's how you ended up with in the room with Steely Dan while they were recording Asia. <laughs> yeah. They, <Wow. laughs> they, they. they chose me but also i kind of fought for that too when i knew they were coming in uh i did my homework um and i had a good friend who worked for warner brothers and back then you had you know um um, um promotional copies and so i had him pull um, a copy from their library of all of their previous LPs and I studied them, just played them down, listened to all the songs, knew the order on every album and who played on what, and you know, really educated myself um, to be as knowledgeable about their musical approach and recording approach as possible, even though it was, you know, I hardly knew anything back then. Right. You know, you get out of recording school and and get a gig, and the first thing you learn is how much you don't know. Yeah, yeah and yeah. Um, so uh, that's where I really cut my teeth with uh, Roger Nichols, was their engineer, and he was so generous with his knowledge and um, you know information and showing me stuff and all of that. And uh, why Steely Dan records sound like Steely Dan records, yeah. you know? Well, it, it must have been so interesting to be in the, because, I mean, that, that, I mean, that record, there's, I don't know if you've ever watched the classic albums thing that was on VH1, but, like, I rewatch those over and over again. I mean, not over and over again, but I watch them, like, every year, like, every single one. And, and the one about mm -hmm. Asia is great because that's where I discovered the, the isolated vocals of Peg with just like however many Michael McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. I was there for that. Oh, you were? Oh, God. I read that. I know that because I was there when he had to do it. Oh. And, um, yeah, there were uh, other background singers. I, I'm pretty sure it was Clyde e. King and Vanetta Fields and and uh, Shirley Matthews. Those were the three main, you know, A team background singers back right. then, along with the Waters family. And um, uh, so they were on. They did a lot of the backgrounds, but his voice was so signature yeah. to yeah. Steely Dan songs and. So he'd come in and yeah. It's interesting. I've actually heard him talk about um, uh, uh, that sometimes they were beyond like that. What 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 Donald and, and Walter wanted him to do was beyond his abilities. And he would sometimes have to just learn whatever that harmony part was and not hear any other voices and just sing that. Yeah. Like he admitted yeah. said that um, he was like he was like they, they like sometimes he would be like, man, I, you might need another guy. Yeah, it's tough. Well, you know, there'd be a half half tone difference between 
the part he did before, you know, exactly. and few of the yeah. notes. So it would be a chord. He'd be singing a you know right. chord, and um, it's like those Beach Boy or Barbershop level harmonies that mm-hmm. are that are super close mm-hmm. and very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, also, like I mean, we're, what what was it like seeing somebody? Because that record in 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 particular, and I don't know how many records were made like this before, but it's such a big deal that they would sort of bring in like a rhythm section. Oh, these guys didn't work for this, so. We'll use them on this song, but we'll bring in these other guys for this song. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like that that mm-hmm. aspect of it. What what did it look like to some young assistant engineer? I have no point of reference. In the room, like, oh, you didn't? No, I just thought, well, that's just one of the ways you record. It's not a band. They're they're bringing in session people and. They want a particular sound, a particular drummer, a particular approach, and um, they'll try, um, you know, this bunch. And yeah. basically all they were trying to capture was the drums and the vibe. They would, they pretty much replaced everything else. Okay. It was rare when they kept anything that was uh, cut in the basic um, tracking session. Except yeah. the drums. Did you, so you got to you know, as long as they got that. Yeah. As long as they got that, then they didn't matter what anything else was. And if something did work, yeah. that great. But yeah. they were, you know, very specific in their needs for their music. Yeah. You got to witness uh, the pretty shuffle in person then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How cool yeah. is that? <laughs> That was very cool. That's amazing. that was very cool. I was tell I told myself a, a bunch of times today that I wasn't going to do that Chris Farley imitating or interviewing uh, Paul McCartney thing where I'm just like, <laughs> that was cool, right? <laughs> oh man, I can't believe I asked that. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there'll be a little while after this after this conversation that I'll be doing that to myself. <laughs> okay, so um, you know. What? It's all good. All good. What was your role? I saw also that you'd worked on the last waltz. Mm-hmm. What what were you, what was what were you doing there? Were you at the at the gig? I was assisting. Well, see, um, you know, most of the music was um, um, recorded live. If you if you've seen the movie, you know that the majority of it is their last waltz on thanksgiving right their last time with all of these people playing together and um but they had a few studio um filmed pieces uh, like with um um oh i know what you're talking the about people singers yeah. and and uh with uh emmy lou harris and and uh singing evangeline right that was filmed on a sound stage the last song out of the blue um, was, um, that, I think that's what it was called. That's the one where they're playing, on the, the stage they're playing those weird instruments. Of, like, do, 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 yeah, exactly, exactly. Do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bella Likas and all of that, yeah. the, the waltz there. But uh, so my, my job was in the studio, Studio B at the Village, where they were mixing those for the film. Awesome. And uh, and actually, you may have heard this story. I didn't tell it much because I didn't know if I'd get in trouble or not. <laughs> and but I'm the only one who can really document it, and uh, I'm the only one who who knows. So I don't know if it happened or not. But um, Robbie Robertson and Rob Fraboni had been just you know working day and night for weeks. Um, after the filming and then to get it all ready and Scorsese had his schedule and all of this sort of stuff. And so then when the night came that uh, uh, they had to mix Evangeline, um, they got it all up sort of, but they were so exhausted. Their hands both were shaking for, you know, yeah. a variety of I've reasons. Seen the movie. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and I was the only one who was well rested and um, had not um, had those experiences in the 
because you know the the lowly assistant doesn't so right. um yeah so um when it came to you know balancing the tracks and, and with the faders um uh, i could do it there's no automation back then so there was nothing you know set in stone you had to play the console yeah which is also another thing I enjoy. So fun. Doing, yeah, yeah. Which is, I love, it's a performance. Yeah. You yeah. know, and uh, so, um, uh, so anyway, that's what I did because it was 3.30 in the morning about, and and they were freaking out, and uh, the song, the mix had to be on the dub stage at 8 a.m. And, um, yeah, so, so I mixed it, and it went off and yeah. maybe they did remix it later. I don't think so because those schedules don't happen. Um, I don't know, but it's from, from that night or morning, as far as I know, I think that was my first mix <laughs> <laughs> that went anywhere. That's and, great. Uh, but I'm the only one who knows that. Yeah. Or, 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 or suspects that I don't, you know, in in that era, uh, the 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 I I, I read I, I read so much stuff <laughs> about You're you. You're so good. And, uh, I'm getting confused of where I read it, but there was a. Uh, you talked about how there uh, there at one point weren't mix engineers. There wasn't like a Jack Joseph Quig or or Lord Algae guy. You sent your stuff to uh, that that usually it was the engineer who did the record that mixed it. Is that is that right well that was my experience right. um you it took a project um you know there was the occasional project that came in and you just did some overdubs and then it went away or um you know i don't recall many sessions that were um something that had just come in just to be mixed there yeah typically back then people stayed at a studio or you had the same producer and the same engineer and um and that way you knew you know you're mixing as you're recording right. so when you finally get in your head and you know you're doing your rough mixes for the overdubs and things so you've got a really good feel for that and that ultimately dictates what the final mixes are about it wasn't like well we want so-and-so to put their spin on it or well except for okay steely dan um the ba basic tracks were cut um either by bill schnee um roger nichols elliot shiner or al schmidt as far as i know mm -hmm. because some were already cut uh, when it came to the village, the basic tracks, but also they did new versions of them uh, too, um, some of them, and uh, and they then a uh, master reel was assembled. So I didn't know where the different takes came from, you know, and at that point that was just all these are the masters and this is what we're going to mix to or this is what we're going to record to and then finally mix and then it, when the mixes happened the same sort of thing happened uh i know um we recorded uh peg did a version uh, did a mix of peg at the village um and when i uh mentioned that to al schmidt um and he said well um i mixed that and i went oh well uh we did too and um i said boy that would be really interesting to and then bill schnee said well i mix some some of these songs too so um we don't i don't know which one went on the record right um gary katz who's still alive and donald would probably know but um I've never asked them, but it was so funny when I was when somebody asked me at this lunch that we have every week um, here in L.A. 
an audio lunch bunch. So people who just come and hang in, it's, you know, our tribe and it's fun and you go if you can. Oh, that's it's a Mexican cool. restaurant. It's very cool. And so Al would come quite often and um, somebody asked me about it. You rarely talk about business at these things, but somebody asked me about that. And I said, well, we, we mix peg. And <laughs> I hear him say, I mix peg. <laughs> and, oh, uh, and that was the first time it ever dawned on me that maybe somebody else would mix it. So there's that um, situation. But typically, you went from fruit to nuts and um, with the same people. Right. Now, with Breakfast in America, sadly, what happened um, here, I worked on that for seven and a half months. And was so excited when we started to mix and all of that. And um, what they were taking home wasn't sounding like what they needed for some reason. And uh, so they took the project away and went to Crystal Sound and mixed there for about a month. And I was just devastated because I was, I'd been there from the beginning yeah. and um, it was so close to everybody and to not be able to be a part of the mix process with everyone. And they tried to bring me over saying how uh, instrumental I would be in the mixing process right. because I knew where every right. thing was and all of that. But the village said, well, then you can quit your job and go be mixed with this record and all the best to you. And it was like, um, I can't do that. And they didn't have a budget for me anyway. Right. And um, this, you know, Crystal had their own assistant. Right. So it, it just, it was heartbreaking. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. That, that record is huge for me. Like huge, huge, huge. Um, is that a CP70? I'm glad you like it. Like, like on, on Breakfast in America, like is that piano a CP70? Like with a chorus on it or something? What What's going on with that thing? <laughs> like um, a Yamaha, like electric grand piano, those? Well, that, well, no, we had, it wasn't a Yamaha. Um, we went around to all these different places to find the right piano, um, like um, in private homes. Somebody would have a Bosendorfer. No shit. And, and somebody would have, and so Rick would try these different pianos yeah. until he found one. And then we rented that one, whatever it was. And, um, and it's been so long. I, I hesitate to say what it was yeah. um, because I may get it wrong. Yeah. That's all right. That's all right. That was it. Just knowing that, that you guys went around looking for the right piano, like at people's houses and stuff. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody would say, oh, I know somebody who's got, you know, um, what was it? A Bu Bu Rick? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. You know, some wonderful pianos and Rick would try, you know, we probably tried half a dozen yeah. here and there. When, when you say something now, like seven and a half months. <laughs> on a record mm -hmm. like there's i'm sure there's mm -hmm. somebody young listening to this and thinking like oh well they must have gone like twice a month for seven and a half months but when you say seven and a half you're talking like six days a week probably of five days five days five okay days. okay okay and they no they moved in that very first yeah. day when i um showed up and they were very surprised to have a girl and got over that really quickly, which was fine. But um, uh, when they were moving in the drums and moving in the amplifiers and moving in the keyboards and the guitars, they're also moving in rugs and lamps and plants and pictures. Yeah. And they moved in. Um, and that's where they lived. So as a musician and recording person as well. So there was no, was there at, and when you're doing a record like that with a band like that, that already has uh, success and a track record and they mm -hmm. come in and move into a studio like this, like bringing plants and stuff to the point where they're, they're doing that. Was there like no pre-production 
did y'all hear the songs for the first time like there were they kind of half written or what was going on no they did a lot of rehearsal they had their own studio uh, called Southcombe on Magnolia, where their management company was. Mm-hmm. And um, so upstairs or in the back or somewhere, and they had a rehearsal studio where they recorded a, and worked through a lot of these songs. Some of these songs, like the song Breakfast in America, Roger had written like when he was 17. Oh, really? And uh, yeah, and so they, you know, some of them were new, like um, Take the Long Way Home happened during the recording basic tracks yeah that was brought in in the middle and um but some of them had been written by either rick or roger at some other point or they wrote them during the rehearsal time so they really did have a lot of it down there was still a lot of room for magic and you know genius solos right, right. and things like that or working out different parts or you know inspiration um but the the songs were pretty much worked through except for take the long way home wow that's that's interesting to know um so uh, i could go all day on that record because i really have so many questions but um i you also got to work on tusk which is a huge that's one of my favorite records as well well, my my participation on Tusk was um, just when, I mean, they went through all of the assistants there. We all got to work on it. Um, there were, uh, their main person who worked with them was um, Hernan Rojas. And, uh, uh, and sometimes he wouldn't be able to work or, you know, they were working long, hideous hours and all of that. And actually, there were a lot of times when we were just, you know, hanging out there. Um but um, occasionally I did get to be the assistant on that or help. Uh, they, they were doing a variety of records and artists at kind of at the same time, too. Uh, Mick was pro- had an executive production position with a few other artists. And um, so um, those were going on along with Tusk. Okay. Like, um, um Magnet and Steel, that was a song. It's one of my favorite uh, songs, too, yeah. Yeah, so they were part of that. And uh, Sentimental Lady, I had to work on that. (laughs) Um, And then I was the main assistant for one of their artists named Danny Duma, who had been in a band called The Big Waku that Ken Calais had produced a couple records with. And, boy, that was one of those records that should have gone to wonderful places i mean eric clapton was on it and and uh, christine mcvee and i mean a whole bunch of people played on it as well and so uh, for these things i would assist and there would be um getting drum sounds and so ken would set me send me out there to um you know kick um mix drums which you know Here's little me yeah. and here's great big Cammy. <laughs> and I'd say, Ken, um, th- there's no way I can do this kick drum like he can. Well, just do everything you can. I'm just like, bam, 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 bam. <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, um, anyway, that was fun. Oh, that's a, like a dream. Oh, yeah. I, I read that book, the Ken Calais book. Oh, good. Yeah. I've only read ago. part of it, I have to say, because... Um, I, it's hard for me to to read books when I was kind of there, yeah. you know. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I kind of yeah. don't want to know I, or I, I don't want to go back there so right, much. Right, right. I read those books because I wasn't there. You know what I mean? And I yeah. wish I was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, read the, I love reading the ones where I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> It's so funny because there were so many other worlds going on. I don't know if you watch those uh, Sunset Sound now has this uh, has a whole video channel on YouTube. I haven't, and I went oh. to the the Dave Grohl where he goes to all the different oh, studios. The, the, and yeah, that was that a great. One? That no, no, no. This is a completely different thing. It's just 
it's very like homemade. The it's it's like the it's like the produced like a pro, but they're just like at sunset. They're talking to like uh, oh. Susan Rogers and other other folks that, that mm-hmm. worked on records. There's mm-hmm. a lot of Van Halen. There's <laughs> there's a whole lot of people talking about Van Halen records there on that thing. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So yeah, sounds uh, sunset sound is right. Sound City was one wonderful. that Dave Grohl did a, a a documentary about. Well, he did that. That was the movie, yeah. but he yeah. did a series yeah. where he, he came here, went to all these different recording studios, yeah. and and I didn't have the cable channel or something. That's and a great one. It's actually. one of those things I have to go back and see because that I would love. Yeah, you know. Yeah, um, I have to do that. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so um so you ended up after after those records in your time at village you ended up working with with this cat mike chapman and that's where yeah, we started well, was, we started this conversation you were working with mike chapman and yeah 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 um yeah i was uh well i was at the village and um i don't even know how i heard about it but um he was obviously, well, back then, he was, um, you know, like producer of the year or whatever. He had all these pop hits and, you know, Heart of Glass and and um, uh, Ballroom Blitz and, right. you know, My Sharona and, yeah. you know, all of this stuff. And um, he was looking for a female engineer that he could mold to, into being the first hit um producer woman producer so uh i went you know um that sounds good to me but the the recording uh the world and you know i can say this because he knows um they didn't take him seriously they thought oh don't work with him it'll ruin your reputation and um you know here you've got this you know, catalog of work that you've worked on and right. here you're going to go and work with this madman doing all of this <laughs> cheesy little stuff. And, um, and I went, well, um, <laughs> so I did it and, um, I am ever so grateful I did, even though it was wild and crazy and completely different than any other way I'd made records with anyone. Um, however, there was a reason he was such a hit producer and songwriter and all of this. And yeah, he, he was wild and crazy. And yet uh, I learned so much from him about being a good producer, you know, um, keeping things on track and all, you know, he just had a formula and boom, 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 boom. And he would work with people and all. And, but he wanted the, to raise the bar for him too. And I had relationships with uh, musicians and things that, um, you know, he wanted to be able to work with and would know, you know, um, who to hire or whatever. And um, can you hear that? Yeah. What's going on there? Oh, terremoto. That is, is that really thunder? Loud. Sorry. No, it's uh, I live by Cedars Sinai oh. Hospital, and it's probably a jet helicopter. Um, it's not that bad. You know, medevacking somebody right, in. Right. Um, but in my headphones, it's like really loud. Uh, so sorry. Um, so um, so Mike was uh, wanting to be able to work with some of the people and and. I think that's why he chose me over maybe some other people, other uh, other women he may have interviewed is because I could bring something to his table too. And, um, so, um, so off I went. Yeah. And, and it was wild and woolly and we cranked out songs and I learned a lot and had some, Great experiences and can I ask you and about, made my made the biggest record I ever yeah, made right and you, you were know? the first woman to record a certified platinum album with that album. Well, that's uh, that's um, documented. You know, there may have been so many women over at Capitol that never got even credit 
for what they worked on or, you know, back in the 50s and 60s that were actually producers, but they weren't given credit and they didn't get platinum records or whatever. Yeah. And we don't know that for a fact. So um, I, I can say that uh, as far as we know, and documented, I am the first woman with a platinum album. Yeah. Engineering and a then, platinum album. And then I guess Susan Rogers is second. Right? Would she be? Quite possibly. Quite possibly. Quite yeah. possibly. There was uh, yeah. Terry Becker, who is no longer with us. Um, she did, she worked on a Kansas record, but um, her credit was um, skewed a little bit on that. Right. Um, there, you know, there are some other people who could be out there, um, but um, as far as I know, I'm it. And then Susan Rogers, and then yeah. you know Sylvia Massey, and yeah. you know there are a few of us. Um, Denny King yeah. was another one. I don't know what I don't know all their discographies. Sherry Klein, she was Kim Fowley's engineer, so she worked with. <laughs> The Orchids, that's how yeah. we met when, you know, there was Mike Chapman and Kim Fowley were, <laughs> you know, yeah. rivals. Yeah. And we had a showdown at midnight one night and turns out Sherry was his engineer and I was Mike's and we just went, hey, you're a girl too. And she and I are best friends to this day. <laughs> so that was nuts. I, I miss the fact that I didn't experience Kim Fowley, but I have a couple of friends that had meetings with him and just the things that he told them they should do with their bands was literally some of the funniest shit I've ever heard in my life. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did want to ask you because yeah. there, there was, you talked a little bit about these records on, on the producer pro thing, but, but some of the records you did with Mike Chapman and it seems like people at that point were kind of looking to Mike Chapman and, and you to take an artist that, that needed to transition from their success in the last decade into this new decade. So you guys did records with like Cher and like uh, Tanya Tucker. Tanya Tucker. And and was yeah. that was that kind of the, the, the label go like we're getting this Chapman guy, he's bringing him into the 80s. I or maybe Mike went after them or okay. something, but you know when Cher wanted to do her rock and roll yeah. uh, record um, well, she was one of the, it was called Black Rose was the name of the band. And she sincerely wanted to be just a band member and, um, can't really do that. Yeah. She doesn't have the luxury of that. Yeah, yeah. No, she did. She wasn't allowed to do that. Yeah. And, um, but, uh, but that was a lot of fun to work on Yeah, and, you know, to do the rock band thing with her and then with tanya tucker you know tear me apart if you want to win my heart and and uh but it was also poppy it, um she wanted to get away from the the country thing right at that point right and um and so she did yeah and um there was yeah there was one record that you mentioned but i uh, i don't think i have a feeling that uh that I'm drawing a blank on his name. The 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 guy from the from the produced like a pro didn't get. But did you guys do a spider record? Did you say that? Oh, and we did a spider. Yeah. Record. Okay, so you yeah, did. You we did, did. did. Did you do the record oh, gosh, that, yeah. that had uh, obsession on it? It had what song? Obsession, because wasn't Holly Knight was in that band, right? Yeah, Holly Knight. Yeah, yeah. Well, we did. Um, um, you know what I have to look on that. I don't remember if it had obsession on it, but it had um You Better Be Good to Me. Right, right. Um, I've heard we that recorded version. that. Yeah. 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 And so I got to record that. And um and they were great. Uh, Amanda was the lead singer and Holly Knight was in it and Anton Fig was a drummer. Was the drummer, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. What a cool band. A, that was one of the very first projects I worked with Mike on. And um, so I was still getting my sea legs with yeah. him, trying to figure out what the heck is going on here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, and you did a, a Michael DeBar record? Yes. That I'm only human. I'm only human. What a character. Yeah, it was that really guy. good. We, what's that? What a character, like a real rock and roll character. He is brilliant, sensitive, funny out there outrageous 
he wasn't sober yet when <laughs> we did that record up in Sausalito. None of us were. Oh, and, you uh, did that at the record plant where the inc- I, we, we did that at the record plant in Sausalito, and boy, that almost did us all in. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I've said this term before, but I, sp- I spent a week there one night with <laughs> oh, <laughs> with mm-hmm. Lars Ulrich mm-hmm. and uh, and Bob Rock working on one of my tunes that oh, Lars wow. was trying to, I, I was signed to Lars's label in the late nineties and early two thousands. And, and, oh, wow. and at one point he decided he wanted to play drums on one of our songs. And so I went there to record it with him and Bob Rock and it, it didn't happen. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Well, the, we had, uh, we were in one room, so we did three or four records in, at the South Soledo record plant. And in the other room was um, Rick James. And uh, (laughs) so we had to be pals. And uh, he'd come hang out in our session. And and I, he had a great entourage of wonderful musicians and people and horn players and all of that. I mean, boy, those, that was wild and crazy. And then (laughs) Sly Stone had his place in there. And sometimes, um, um, Van Morrison would be there. There was this room that was just kind of the control room was a pit and the room was all around it. Kind of, it was unusual. Uh, it was, those were pretty <laughs> out there. At times. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Rick James for being such a, a, a famous disaster was also so brilliantly talented, man. Equally talented. He was, to his disastrous. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. he had, uh, Issues. Yeah, he did you have know. issues. He did. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. so at this point, you, when you when you go make a record like you made the one with Janova Magnus, who I have to give a shout mm-hmm. out while we're talking and thank her for yes. introducing us to each other uh, when I asked her to. Yes, thank you, Janova. Or as I sometimes get to call her Geneva Mangrass, just because <laughs> everybody I've known her for so long, and you know we always make fun of the way people make fun of our names. So uh, yeah. <laughs> Janova Magnus. It's Janova Magnus. Janova Magnus. <laughs> and I also have to thank my friend Angel M, who I think you know, because that's how yes. I heard about you. That's how I discovered who you were. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's through her. Yeah, She's an old friend of mine. Well, she's fantastic. Fantastic. I adore her. Yeah. She lives yeah. up to her name. Brilliant, wonderful. Yeah, she's she and um, another girl engineer, um, jasmine mills we were kind of like the the little trio running around the nam show together oh cool Cool. (laughs) a a few years back we were yeah and we would always go to aes meetings together we'd meet up first and i don't know we were just like we you know had a lot of fun together i miss her yeah i do hopefully we'll get together again soon yeah um i so uh, so, so if someone if someone wants to work with you they can reach out to you send you some music but you don't really you're not trying to be making records all the time with bands. Oh, I no. love ma- making okay. records with bands. Okay. Sure. Okay. Cause you have, you have a lot of different, like you, you've done all of this different, uh, work within the engineering and recording world. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. like you were talking about all of the, uh, the, uh, the Foley mixing and editing and stuff like that. And uh, well, I did that for a bunch of years. And um, and then I got a gig. Uh, I went to a party. You may have heard this story because I always tell my students that if I'm doing a workshop or whatever, I say, you know, it's it's not. Who, you know, it's who knows you. Yeah. And um, as well. Yeah. And so get out there. And um, I've gotten all my best jobs at parties or at social situations and this one here i've been doing posts for a long time and and i'm a friend of mine was opening up a mastering studio and he was having an open house and i just went oh i don't want to go it's a sunday and blah, 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 way across town well i'm gonna go anyway and i walk in and there's a woman who uh, was a um, supervisor on one of the kids shows or projects i worked on for disney doing Foley and sound effects and stuff. And she said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, 
I used to be in the music business because in post, you can't talk about that. Right. They they don't like the M word or they didn't then. A lot of people, <laughs> you know, were disgruntled music industry right, people right. who said, I'll show you. I'm going to go into post and wipe you out. Or yeah. I don't know. Anyway, so you could never nobody knew. And uh, um, so she goes, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I used to be in the music business. And she goes, can you read a score? And I said, yeah. And she goes, can you be in Tel Aviv in three weeks? And I said, sure. Why? <laughs> and and she goes, well, I'm with DreamWorks now, and we need uh, somebody to go supervise who can uh, um, work on the foreign versions of these hit songs written by Elton John for this movie called The Road to El Dorado. Right. And um, they dubbed them, you know, in kids' movies and animated features, they dub in like 70 different languages because kids can't right. read something. Right, right. So she, I got sent off to to Tel Aviv and worked with you know star talent there, and that started a six year thing as a foreign dubbing supervisor with DreamWorks, which was the dream heroin job because wow. you had to be ready when they needed a supervisor. There was like a little slew of us. And uh, they'd say, can you be in Istanbul in three weeks? Or can we, you know, somebody that we had doing the show in Rome can't do it. Can you go? And so you didn't dare take another, like, uh, TV series or animated series or anything. Because if DreamWorks called and you said, I can't do it, you may never get called again. Yeah. So you would... It, it it was the best job, and if you worked like three or four months out of the year, when they had a release, um, you know, you could probably live off of that for That's the whole year. But um, but maybe you couldn't. But you didn't want to screw that up. So right, right. it was very stressful. But um, one of the times um, working on Shrek two in, in Athens. <laughs> um, I was, uh, yeah, doing the, the Greek version of I'm holding out for a here. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it was so much fun. And producing this, um, she was, um, uh, they all wanted star talent. She was an opera singer in her early 30s, but she was so structured. And I was going, oh, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work at all. And I was producing the vocal. And so I had said to her through an interpreter, I said, um, did you ever go into the bathroom when you were like 13 and 14 and grab your hairbrush and sing along to, you know, uh, Debbie Harry or Blondie or somebody like that? Did you just like rock out and want to be a rock star and did that in your bathroom in the mirror? And she went, yeah, yeah, I did. And I said, now's your chance <laughs> now's your chance <laughs> and she went oh, ah. so she went in that room and i'm stood in front of the window and i'm you know yeah, acted yeah. out the song and gave her you know cheered her on and, and she said it changed her life and she brought i'm looking at the presents right now that she brought me the next day she brought me all this stuff and oh. just saying you you opened me up to a whole new world i can't thank you enough and blah 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 and i said that's it i gotta make records again oh that's <laughs> awesome that's, that was it and i yeah. came and guess what so i come home yeah you know, from yeah Greece and Istanbul. I did the Greek and Turkish versions of, of Shrek 2. So I get home and just like the next day, Janova calls. And I just said, I got to make records again. And Janova calls and she says, Denise, I'm supposed to um, produce this record for this artist, Rich Del Grosso, a blues mandolin record. And I have to go to Memphis for something or whatever. And I can't do it. Do you want to do it? Wow. Next day. Next day. Wow. And I went, sure. Yeah. So that's when I started producing records. And I just kind of said to the universe, you know, uh, I know it's not about the money, but it's my heart's passion. And I've got to make records again. And 
I know you'll support me somehow. Yeah. On this. So I still do some posts very rarely, but once in a while I get to do that. And um, I do other things and I consult and whatever. But uh, but my my happy place is in the studio with artists and and, you know, making records, do, recording music. I love with people I, I, I adore. Yeah. I have to like the people and I have to like the music. That, yeah. Those are the two things. Otherwise, I'm not the right person for the project. Right. They deserve somebody who is, but so do I. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so I, I do that. I do that. Do you, where do you, do you, uh, do you go, do you get to still work in some nice studios? You get to go back to village and work there? Or? I have. That's nice. And I've worked at East West. That, uh, when I was with Mike, I was, it was called United Western then. And uh, so we had studio three, kind of four walled for a long time. Right. At least a year. It feels like two years. And, uh, but I did a lot of records there and, um, and there are a lot, you know, there's so many neat studios in it. And, um, a lot of them have closed or become private studios, yeah. but other ones are opening and there's, you know, um, that's where it's really good to, you know, know people and yeah. they know you because sometimes they come up to me and want me to work in their studio. You yeah. know, if you have a project, I'll give you some time. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're a legendary engineer. <laughs> you are, you're, a, you're, a, you're, a, you're a, a, a pioneer in your field. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm proud I, to say yeah. that I'm an old sage and doing this that I've, um, I'm, I want to represent, um, women and I want to represent, uh, all the people who aren't, um, white straight men who want to be, uh, in this industry. Yeah. It was, it's genderless. It's, um, yeah. all those things. It, it has to do with your desire and how you're wired, right. you know, how you, you know, and that's all that matters. Um, your passion for this, you have to be passionate yeah. and it's not for everybody, but if it is for you, those other things shouldn't matter. And more and more don't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Lenise, this has just been, it's been a real treat and I, I, I could go on forever. <laughs> I could too. I'm having yeah, so much fun I've, with you, I've Johnny. Really Thank you so talking. much I've, for I've, asking me. I would like it if you if you don't mind, man. Let's do this again sometime because I love I love talking. I would love it. I, I also I would love, love the, it. I love the yeah. fact that you've turned around to make sure that you're uh, educating those people coming up behind you and and making sure that there's a world for that. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. aware. Do you know the band Spoon? They're like an indie no. rock band. Sp Spoon. Um, Spoon. Yeah. S P O O N. Yep, like the utensil. Like like a spoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there. Well, there used to be one a long time ago. Is this a new one? Yeah. Well, no. This one's been oh, around okay. for like twenty five years. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Same band. So their drummer Jimmy okay. No uh, has a really wonderful recording studio here called Public Hi-Fi. But he started a program uh, for f just to have like scholarshipping women into learning how to record at his studio. Cool. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, cool. I'm I've always been a big fan of that. I feel like the energy needs to be balanced. I I am always there's usually a woman in whatever band I'm in. I have a band that's all women Good. and just me. Um and mm -hmm. so so there there is that thing and I I talked to a few people about this and and it's funny because it's nice to be able to to change that thing and um and and I view it as like not not like people keeping women out, but the way that we were all programmed as kids. And I mean, I'm a little younger than you, but like kids now, like when I was a kid, mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I, I got like tinker toys and stuff, right? And stuff to build stuff and stuff to mm -hmm. make things. And I heard you talk about wanting to yeah, play with we, models and <laughs> stuff like that as opposed to dolls and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. My brothers would get Heath kits where they could build preamps and build, you know, radios and, yeah. and things. And I would, gives you a I would get doll. stuff that, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, as, and you know, 
you know? Yeah. And um, so I would just ask, please, can I at least have models? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I can build models too. Yeah. And um, yeah. And so now girls get to do that, but it, you know, that wasn't appropriate. It, it um, wasn't for girls back then, which is stupid. Um, I'm fortunate enough that when working at the village, which I'm so grateful for back then that the owner, um, Jordy Hormel, he was the one who felt that having women in the studio was a really good idea. Yeah. And, um, so, um, because that was my first and only assisting gig, um, I had no other point of reference. Right. And so I did not know women did not do that. Right. I only knew of one woman, uh, actual engineer producer, and she worked on classical music. Um, Kath- Catherine King was her name. Um, but um, there were three other assistants that were women where I worked. So it seemed normal to me. And um, it wasn't a hindrance just once was just one time um the producer of this project that i was put on said that um he wanted a guy in there because i inhibited his barroom banter yeah (laughs) by being a girl and you know what he would he was such a slime ball. It wasn't a good match anyway. So I was really glad that he said that. And I was really happy to not work with him. That's good. That's good. And I, th- I don't think any guy would have liked it that much either. No, no, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, it's so yeah, it was that's that kind funny. of thing. It's funny. When I was uh, 17, I remember distinctly my half brother and sister. My, 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 uh, my brother was two. My sister was, was four. And my stepmom had bought everybody uh, uh, custom shirts. But like, you know, mine had a guitar or something on it. And my sisters said, uh-huh. my sisters said, future Miss America. And my brothers said, future president of the United States. And I remember distinctly in that moment going like, oh, this is where it starts. <laughs> it's programming. Yeah. Like, that's what you're capable of. You're capable of, mm-hmm. if you can walk across the stage without falling down in a long dress, you and made heels, it. And heels, yeah, or, <laughs> yeah, or a bathing suit. Yeah, and yeah. Son, son, you can be the leader of the free world. <laughs> you know? Exactly. And Well, yeah. I'm, um, my, my contrary nature, let's put it like that, yeah. I'm the youngest of six kids, and so I had three brothers, and my dad was technical, and... So I was always very comfortable around guys and technology and, you know, building stuff. And, and, uh, uh, so when I was, when put in like in kindergarten, uh, I only wanted to paint and, and take blocks and make things out of stuff. Right. And I remember something spilled one time and they said, Oh, we'll go get the broom out of the, the kitchen area, the toy kitchen area. And I said, well, I don't know where it is. And they said, what you, what? you've never played house. <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> go get the broom for me, please. <laughs> you go get it. <laughs> That is great. <laughs> you, but that was the truth. Yeah, you know? I, I wasn't that. That you know that that gene died in the gene pool somewhere, drowned in the gene pool. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not a domestic goddess. <laughs> that's okay. You don't have to be, right? No. Someone's got to make cool records. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I can do a lot of house stuff. It's just not a priority. Yeah. Me neither. You know. Um, yeah. This is, we, yeah, we should do this. I'll reach out again and we should stay in touch because I, I really, do, I Johnny. really enjoyed talking to you and, and really like what an inspiration, uh, uh not just Thank to me, but, but to a whole generation, a couple of generations of women and inspiring them to keep going in this business. And <laughs> by now, yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. That means a lot. That's, um, you know, that's what's most important to me. You know, you um, teach by demonstration and and just being authentic. And um, hopefully that 
help somebody else be that thing they want to be. Okay. If I've done that even a little bit, you know, I'm very happy about that. But thank you for saying that. Oh, it's true. It's true. But, but thank you for, for taking the time to talk to me on my show. And um, I'll stay in, in touch. In the time. Okay. I'll take you up on thank that. Thank you. Please do. I'll let you know Please when do. it comes out and everything. It's been a real pleasure, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, great, Johnny. You take care, all right? All Be right. well. You too. All right. Bye. Bye for now. Bye. Lenise Bent, what a great story she has, man. Go to LeniseBent.com for all of your ne- Lenise Bent needs. Uh, find out what's going on with her. Find out uh, she's an educator. She's out there doing all the stuff that all the, you know, you do when you get on in your career. You look back and you make sure that there's other women coming up and doing this. So uh, I want to thank Lenise for sitting down and doing the show and talking to me. It was really, really great getting to talk to her. Uh, I want to thank Janova Magnus for introducing us and my friend Angel M for introducing me to who Lenise is. All right. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Again, go to LeniseBent.com for all of your Lenise Bent needs. And also, gang, don't forget that you can subscribe to this podcast wherever it is that you find podcasts, be it Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, TuneIn, Overcast, Stitcher, all those places. New shows every Tuesday, every Friday. Jeremy Nail will be on the show on Tuesday. Jeremy Nail, one of my favorite songwriters, one of my favorite people, and my dear, dear friend and former bandmate. Man, we have a great conversation. It gets very heavy, but it's very good. Once again, I want to thank Lenise Bent. Lenise Bent, what a legend. Man, had her on the show, gang. Boom. Have a great weekend. Let's get down.
Cause the man from Mars won't eat up bars where the TV's on. Now he's gone back up to space where he would have a hassle with the human race. And you hip hop and you don't stop, just blast off. Sure shot, cause the man from Mars stopped eating cars and eating bars. And now he only eats guitars. Yeah! <laughs> 